Um, okay, so good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us this evening for a very special event. Every year for the past, I don't know, quite a few years, we have been doing an annual event during October normally to honor October Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I really want to thank Monica Gerland, who initiated this quite, yeah, let's give her a round of applause because she initiated this quite some time ago and then it happened once and I thought, okay, well, that was nice. And then it happened a second time and I thought, wow, this is even nicer. And now, without even asking, and already well in advance, way before October, a long time ago, Monica's already getting to work. So she's on it and she's on it with great diligence, always coming up with wonderful speakers and a great program. And normally we do it in person, it's in shul, we dedicate an entire Shabbat, we call it Pink Shabbat, and we have a lovely crowd in the synagogue and we have the speakers come, and uh, there's often a lot of goodies. I think I still have a pink scarf and uh, some other, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't come with any pink tonight, I came completely unprepared. But, um, but some of you really came prepared, so I appreciate that. Um, and then we would have a lovely kiddush after, and it was really, really nice. But now times are different, and, uh, but we don't cower, we don't retreat, we just pull forward with all our strength that we can, and no matter the situation, this is of incredible importance. Uh, all, all cancer awareness in general, but particularly breast cancer awareness, as we've been learning in the past few years, because there are so many ways that we can help ourselves, and we know both women and men need to be helping themselves with regular checkups, be on top of things, and if we do things the way we're being taught by our medical experts, we can save and spare ourselves a lot of trouble um, later in life, God forbid. So, and then Monica was telling me the other day, and I've been hearing this from others, that actually COVID has presented a unique challenge over here because whilst everyone's being safely locked down in their homes, which is great in terms of COVID, but not taking the opportunities to go to the checkups and go to your doctor or go to the hospital because not wanting to be in those places, which is understandable, has, however, um, prevented people from taking the measures and the steps they should be taking. So I think there's an, a very important angle this year in terms of COVID. And maybe that's something that our uh, speakers tonight may address. Um, sorry for not giving you a heads up about that, but we'd love to hear something about that as well. And we're very honored to have three wonderful speakers tonight. So we have Dr. Mary Kay Hayes, who is joining us, and I'm going to introduce them with their full bios in a moment. Then we have also Joanna Hoffman, Joanna Katz Hoffman, who is a breast cancer survivor, moved to Miami, South Florida. She's one of those thousand people a day. Well, that was 11 years ago. I don't think it was a thousand people a day back then, but she knows where the good life is. So she came with her family all the way to South Florida. Change of career, change of life. So we're gonna hear from her and her amazing story as well. And finally, we have with us Deborah Litwak. And I'm gonna say that she is not Rabbi Alan Litwak's wife. Rabbi Litwak is Deborah Litwak's husband. I think that's better put, right? Am I right? You're both a wonderful rabbinic uh, pair, couple, family living in our community. And Deborah is very involved. I think she's the South Florida representative and director for Sharsheret. Sharsheret is a fantastic organization helping women or others that are struggling and fighting the battles with breast cancer. So Deborah is here, the representative in South Florida, I believe. So we're very honored that the three of you have joined us tonight and we're looking forward to hearing from you. And thank you everybody else for being here. And this is gonna be recorded, so if anyone needs to hear it later, um, we'll have access to that on our YouTube channel. And I also wanna say that if you have questions, we'd love to answer your questions. Here's the best way to do it. Um, best way is to keep muted throughout the presentation so there's no background noise and we can hear everything properly but feel free to post those questions in the chat, whether it's publicly if you wish, or feel free to private message those questions to me. And I hope by now, eight months into using Zoom, you know how to send that private message to myself or whatever. And then I'll gather all those questions and we're, we are pretty confident that at the end of the evening, 
Um, we're going to have time for some questions. Yes, we know there's a debate tonight, although who really wants to watch that debate? Anyhow, whatever. We're not going there. We're discussing more important or very important issues tonight. So we're going to start off with Dr. Mary Hayes. And I want you to know a little bit about her because it's a tremendous honor that she's with us this evening. She's a board certified radiologist specializing in women's imaging. She earned her degrees from Rutgers Medical School and then completed her training in Los Angeles. And she had a residency at Cedars Sinai Medical Center and also at UCLA Iris Cantor Center for Breast Imaging. She joined out here locally the Memorial Healthcare System in 1992 and was the medical director and chief of women's imaging for over 20 years there. And um, three fellowship trained breast surgeons and a strong multidisciplinary team to treat over 700 new breast cancer, pa cancer patients each year. Dr. Hayes has served on national panels, including the ACR Committee on Communications, the Practice Parameters and Appropriateness Criteria, and if I would read her entire bio, which she deserves, we would run out of time. She's collaborated with a, over a dozen national teams on 3D mammography research and published this work. She's been invited as a speaker to the Congressional Women's Healthcare Summit in Washington, D.C., and received many local awards. Um, she's trained radiologists internationally all over five different continents. And um, she's on the teaching staff of FAU and FIU medical schools. So, uh, and she's continuing teaching through conferences and webinars throughout our COVID-19 journey. So that's a little snippet into the uh, Dr. Hayes who's with us this evening. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute you and spotlight you, doctor. And if you could, so, we're so happy to have you here. And uh, please take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'd like to share my screen if possible. So let me just try to make sure this works. Um, and hopefully it will. Uh, open, yes. Uh, yes. And yes. And, oh, I have to come back in a second. I have. Okay, maybe she got a more important call. All right, Dr. Hayes probably will be back with us in a moment. Hang in there. I, I saw some pictures and somebody sent them out. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so maybe... Okay. Um, Maybe she got any more. What we'll do then, I'm not sure if she's still with us or she, we lost her. So maybe we will, for now, is she on the screen there? Let's go over to our next speaker. And that is our breast cancer survivor, Joanna Hoffman. And as I mentioned earlier, she, Joanna is originally from the Philly area. She used to work in the restaurant business. Um, but together with her husband and two sons, they moved to Miami Beach in 2011, and now she works in real estate. Her husband is an ICU doctor at Memorial West in Pembroke Pines. And Joe, she likes to be called Joe. Joe was diagnosed with 3C breast cancer five months after moving to Miami. And now she's the vice chair of a grassroots breast cancer organization called the Pink Angels, which raises money to help support women who need assistance. So Joanna, and I'm sure this may not be so easy for you, but we're so glad that you're here with us. It's an honor and uh, you are unmuted. I'm now spotlighting you and please Hi. tell us your story. Thank you, Rabbi. So uh, as, as the Rabbi said, I, I moved uh, to Miami in 2011 and shortly after was diagnosed um, with a mammogram, which I was 38 years old. So that what's interesting about that is that uh, if I did not have a family history, and most Ashkenazi Jews do have a family history, and it's one of the factors that triggers an early um, mammogram. I had, this was not my first mammogram. It was not detectable by um, touch. It was only detectable by a mammogram. I was, uh, if I had been diagnosed five years earlier, my diagnosis would have been stage four, which is last stage. They started 3C um, because they're realizing that women who had 
their nodes that were inoperable um, radiated and um, with chemo sometimes we're able to um, I wouldn't say cure but but have have a, a chance to not um, go to stage four so it was uh, for me a very lucky thing to end up in the memorial system with doctors like like dr. Hayes who saved my life and when I uh, finished my my active treatment I wanted to become involved with a, an organization and the pink angels were the organization that that I ended up with very happily because what we do and what I was um, brought into was this incredible group of, of women, uh, Jewish women, Muslim women, Christian women coming together who had um, had the luxury of getting through breast cancer without being financially devastated. We wanted to give, give back to the women of our community that don't have that luxury. It is a very expensive thing to go through. Even with insurance, there's a lot of, of things that you don't um, have covered by insurance. The co-pays alone can be astronomical, and we've met so many women who have to choose between sending their children on a class trip or paying for a wig or paying for groceries or paying for their co-pays. And that for us was not something we wanted to stand by to watch. So we raised millions of dollars and we spend it um, on things that are important to the women in our community. And we ask our doctors and our social workers and our nurses what's important to our patients and we talk to the patients as well we um we put in for instance an ice machine which is strange in memorial west uh, chemo center because the nurses had to walk three rooms away to get ice to put patients fingers in so they didn't get neuropathy and we thought what a waste of time so we we raised money and we bought an ice machine we do things that aren't typical but we do whatever is needed of us um, you know, my story is that I was in my 30s and it's lonely being young when you're diagnosed with cancer. It doesn't feel like something you should be dealing with at that point. I had a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Um, my friends were doing things that were not chemo and radiation and surgery. And I was really happy to be able to speak to people through Sharsheret and other organizations. So I've now spent uh, the last 10 years or so uh, giving my time and, and my energy and my love to these women, mainly younger women who really feel alone and, and they're looking for a community. Um, so actually I'm gonna give you my cell phone number right now. If, if anybody knows of anyone in the area who needs any kind of support, um, I speak to people all the time and it makes, it, it's for me, you know, as well. So my number is 215-888-5222. If anybody knows, especially the young woman um, who's got, there's so many other issues that go along with being under 50 and especially in your 30s or 20s, um, you are dealing with young children. So there's a, you know, different um, needs and different things to talk about and fertility and family planning. Um, most women, one of the, the sad parts is wherever you are with your family planning, it's often taken away from you the ability to make that decision on your own if you're finished. Um, you have to, estrogen's very, usually, not always, but usually very um, bad for women with, uh, young women with estrogen um, positive uh, breast cancer. So I found that talking to women about um, all of these things were not only helped the people in the community, but it helped me work through stuff. So um, I, Ha feel really like my kids now are a junior and freshman in high school. Um, they both were bar mitzvahed, thankfully, before COVID. And, um, you know, I remember sitting in the car when I was newly diagnosed and sort of bargaining with God, can I just make it to see the bar mitzvahs? So now I'm past that and I, I still bargain and want more time. You get, you get a little bit uh, greedy. And um, I just feel really lucky and, and grateful for everything that every day that I've had since my diagnosis, which was a scary diagnosis. And uh, I'm, I'm here just grateful. Um, I'm the Pink Angels, as I mentioned, are um, this, this wonderful group. We do have uh, events throughout the year to raise money. We have a tennis event coming up. It's hard this year raising money. 
A lot of people are having a difficult time financially. So we, we try not, and businesses in particular that have been supportive in the past are, are struggling. But it's important for us to raise this money so that we can we buy many wigs, prosthetics, uh, lymphedema sleeves. We pay for acupuncture. We pay for uh, so many things that go uh, along with with traditional care, and uh, often insurance does not cover. Let's see, um, I'm open to any questions at the end. I'm so grateful that you asked me to be here. I hope that I get to meet you all in uh, in person. This the Zoom thing too. It's it's telling me I don't like my neck. It's been the biggest thing I've learned from Zoom, um, and I just miss being in the room with people and uh, being able to connect in person. So I do look forward to coming back once we're all together in in your synagogue to meet you all. Thank you. Well, wow. Thank you, Joanna, for being so brave and coming up and telling us all about that. And that could not have been easy. I don't want to let you, I don't, I don't want to let you off the hook so easily because <laughs> okay. transition to our next speaker. If I can, I'm just going to ask a question. Um, maybe not an easy one, but if just to get a little deeper into your experience, if we could, what would you say was your hardest experience or darkest moment throughout that part of the journey. And how would you say, if you did, I'm, it seems like you did, you got over that particular bump? So, so the darkest moments, um, you know, obviously the initial diagnosis was shocking. I was, um, uh, my, my husband was working, my kids were in school. It was, I think a Wednesday and I, I went in for my, my yearly mammogram. Um, my technician, I ended up with an ultrasound and the technician in the ultrasound who is still a friend of mine to this day, she's incredible. I just saw her face and I knew right away. It was, her face was just shocked. And she looked at me and I looked at her and I said, tell me, and she said, I can't, the doctor has to tell you. And I said, just, just tell me. And she's like, it's, there's, there's something there. And so, uh, I was, I had just had a mammo and everything was great. I couldn't understand how, um, things had gone so quickly to when I met with the doctor, it was, um, it was very serious. And I was told very quickly that I had to cancel a vacation the following week. I had to start chemo right away. And so I think it was the, what, and what I tell women all the time when I'm speaking to them early on is that until you have a plan, it's the scariest, worst part because you're just floating. You have no real base, no, no foundation. And until you have a plan, everything is, is scary and up in the air. And, and once you're with your team of doctors and they're making a plan for you, you feel cared for and you feel like there's some, there's something happening. But I would say the first four or five days of my diagnosis when I was just told it's, it's bad. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it, it, my weirdly, it was not detectable as I'm, I'd been to the gynecologist the week before and it was not detectable by a, a, an exam by the gynecologist. Um, my lymph nodes in my left armpit were, uh, it ended up after chemo 32 still had cancer. So, um, I had to have, a you know, I had a lot of chemo, I had two surgeries, and I had a lot of radiation. And, um, you know, it's so it was a long process. And then I had to have my ovaries out. That's the other part that is not talked about a lot for young women. I was in my 30s, as I mentioned, and as you know, they don't know, they go back and forth. Is soy good for you? Is soy bad for you? Is alcohol? What's all the different things. But what I do know is that estrogen is my my nightmare. So I had to, um, you know, make sure that was out of my system. So this, the scary parts and the sad parts were just going through things that, um, so quickly and so urgently and the alone part of all, none of my friends were going through this when you're 70, you know, there's different. And I, I talk about, it, it's almost like two different diseases when you're 30 and when you're 70, it's, it's just, it's different. It's a different, um, the, the cancer cells move very quickly when you're young as well. They duplicate like crazy. So uh, the good thing is chemo works really well usually when you're young because of that, the cancer cells gobble up the chemo. But um, because of that, it's a, it's a scary diagnosis. They, they literally said, cancel everything, you're starting chemo in three days. And it was, so 
Um, that was dark. And then the light, you know, the light, I, I had a lot of light through all of it. I have an incredible family and friends just supporting me, a wonderful husband. And I went to a, mu a music festival in Austin City Limits, bald. I didn't wear a wig a lot. I wore a baseball cap and I, I would show you a picture if I remembered to bring one, but I was very, um, I was out and about and out to dinner and we had season tickets to the Marlins and we, I did a lot. So I didn't let it stop me. And I, you know, I, I just wanted to live every moment because it was, it was not clear what the future was. So that's the gift part of it is you do, I, I've been able to live my life as fully as I possibly can because I know how fleeting everything can be. Wow. Um, thank you, Joanna. Um, is this, can I, with your permission, Sure. Is this the uh, picture that you're referring to? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, well, well no. That's, that's, you got a full head of hair over there. That's, I know, I'm like, I'm thinking that is at a baseball game, but what is that? No, that's, that is uh, after, that is long, I think that's a few years. There's, oh, okay. there's a picture I'll try to look for, um, maybe I'll see if, while, while Dr. Hayes is talking, maybe I'll see if I can find it, send it. Okay. Um, an email to you. There's, there's one in particular that's, um, there, there's just, there's a few, but it's, it's really, I think, um, part of the, the beauty of it having, you know, I speak, I speak to women, uh, Char Sherrod does a wonderful job, um, of, of putting women together who, um, have similar, part of the hard part is when, because breast cancer has a million different diagnoses, you can be triple negative, estrogen positive, there's so many different things going on. And then again, the age thing, and if you have children, there's a million different things. So Sharshara, one of the things, I, I get these calls and they're, they're wonderful. They're, they're women who are just looking to connect. And I always tell them, I can remember the darkness, but I promise them that the light is coming. And I show, I often will text them a picture of, me just smiling on a bridge and surfside just so happy and it's it's not it doesn't it doesn't have to the the year of treatment which it is a full year for the most part for a lot of women it doesn't have to be all all darkness it's there's a lot of uh, uh lovely things you do connections you can make through through breast cancer for me uh, this group the pink angels they're you know like sisters to me we've we've really we're, we're for the most part all survivors. Uh, one woman lost her mom when she was really young, so she's very connected. Um, and we we just communicate in a language of of love and and um, and loss, and it's really it's a it's a beautiful thing. Okay, so well, Joanna, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Right now, you look and sound great, and and so positive <laughs> in the way that you're exuding so much hope. So thank you for really uplifting us in that way. And I'm sure there are many other questions, but for now, we're going to shift over to our next speaker. And I already introduced her earlier, but Dr. Hayes is back and hopefully going to get things, uh, be able to work on it. You should be able to share the screen. I've allowed you to do that. So you're spotlighted, Dr. Hayes, please. Take it away. And I understand you work together with Joanna. That's what Joanna mentioned in her, in her talk, so. Yes, yes, sorry about this, Napo. I'm gonna try to share my screen. If I can't, I'll just talk, but I, I'm a radiologist, so I live and breathe in pictures. So I'll give this a try one more time. So let's see. Can you see any part of my screen? Yeah, we see the slide Great. very well. Okay, terrific. So, um, as Joanna said, breast cancer is, uh, it's pretty much non-denominational and it affects women of many ages. At Memorial, uh, our, you mentioned that we see a, and treat about 700 new breast cancer patients each year. Our patients range in age from about 21 to 94 every year. So it's quite a spectrum, and it is uh, a disease that affects women of different generations or different decades in different ways, as Joanna said. And I always wanna try to explain to women that 
um, your neighbor's breast cancer is not your breast cancer. Breast cancer comes in flavors, sort of like Baskin Robbins when you go for ice cream, everything is not vanilla. Um, so share and, and keep people around you that are helpful, but don't assume if someone has a bad story that that's your story because everyone has their own personal journey and you should surround yourself with people that are helpful. And sometimes your family members are your blood relatives, but sometimes your family becomes your pink angel friend or someone who gives you aid in a time of need. So speaking of times of need, we have COVID going on. And there's a few articles that have come out recently. This one happens to be from April. And then there's another one that I'll highlight. But basically the breast community has been trying to figure out what is the best way to triage or prioritize our breast cancer patients during this COVID time. It's unusual and we have to try to figure out what's the best thing to do. So this is another article that just came out this month, but basically as breast cancer specialists, our goal is to take care of the patients within a multidisciplinary team and provide them the best highest level of care uh, in the safest way possible. And so now we have to adapt and allocate resources and make sure we triage these patients to come in when it's the safest for them. In the, initially, we paused all screening, routine screening studies, and we even paused the patients that were planning surgery because it wasn't as safe for them as waiting. So we've done some watchful waiting, and there are scenarios now that have been developed in multidisciplinary teams to figure out who is an urgent patient, who's a high priority, who's medium priority, who's low priority. And so we talk about each, we can't identify every single patient, but we try to put them in significant groups. So sometimes down here, if it's a low priority patient, we might suspend routine screening, or we might only screen mutation carriers. We would work up the chain and we start with the most urgent patients and we work our way down to the least urgent patients. All patients are important, but some people have to be moved to the front of the line based on the disease that they present with. So Joanna mentioned, they said, stop everything, you need to start your chemo in three days. She would have been in that urgent category and somebody else, a neighbor down the street, might have been in the low priority. Not that she's not important, it's just we have to only certain resources and we have to allocate them to the ones that have the most urgent need. We'll get to everybody. So one of the things there's, in this pandemic, there's been some silver linings. So one of the things that we worked on uh, most recently at Memorial, and I continue this research, is working on when a patient has a tumor, we identify it with a, with a biopsy, typically a needle test. And then we need to mark that area. Even if the, the mass is the size of a walnut, with the treatment, the chemotherapies that are given before surgery, we can shrink that down into something that where there are no living cells left. The surgeon still needs to go back and follow up and remove that piece of tissue, so we leave a little marker there. And it's really important, the surgeon needs to know that that marker is in the best place because these, these uh, the breast tissue here, it's just a mound of breast tissue. I call them little milk factories here in blue. And then it's surrounded by a nice gentle layer of fat in the front and in behind. And what's holding it all together are these little ligaments. They're called Cooper's ligaments, but think of them like a puppeteer string. So when the surgeon comes in and starts to um, move down and try to uh, remove the area of interest, he or she has to cut through these strings and everything shifts uh, in the process. So the surgeon needs to be able to find that spot exactly. That's the research that we've been working on. So we put these little chips in that are maybe the size of a half a grain of rice. We put these little markers in. Some of them are inert. They don't do anything. They don't have any activity. But the newer ones that we put in are, uh, I call them disruptive technology. So we've gone from these old-fashioned 
wire phones, and we've gone to these new watches that do multiple tricks. And that's what we've been working on is getting these new smaller devices to work with women in the Department of Radiology that can help our surgeon. And this is an example of these little clips. Here's one clip and here's this one um, that has two little antenna. It's, it works like radar. So if any of you use your phones where you airdrop photos to one another, that's radar. When you land in a plane and they know where to go, that's radar. When you uh, print to your printer across the house um, from your phone, that's radar. So it's inert. It only works when uh, one piece sends a signal at a certain frequency and says, hey, are you here? And the other little receptor says, yes, I'm right here. And they only work when the two are turned on together. The rest of the time they sit inert. While they're sitting inert, the tumor can be shrinking down into nothingness. This is a mammogram picture. This is an ultrasound picture. This is a specimen x-ray picture. And this is an MRI. The MRI is really important because you don't want to have a device where it sends a big black hole. So it's really important to be able to follow these women, these high-risk women, throughout their journey. So some of these women, the marker was just placed and they went on chemotherapy and their surgery was delayed, delayed. So I won't keep you, this is a very busy slide, but I wanna show you that somebody can come in with a mammogram, that's the size of a walnut, that tumor, and her lymph node is about the size of a walnut too. We can give her lots of treatment and shrink that into nothingness. And in the end, this is her post-operative um, actual picture, her post-operative scar is right here 13 days after surgery and this is her armpit so breast surgery doesn't have to be that disfiguring surgery that many of us remember from our mothers or our grandmothers it can be cosmetically uh very um normalizing and this is her with her mammogram in january you can see there's a difference but not too much and she can go on and have routine mammograms and it's a way for women to move on with their lives, feeling whole, not with a daily memory of some disfiguring scar. So those are the things we work on. COVID has presented some unique opportunities to us and we do triage patients, but we also provide these little chips, these little markers for patients so that uh, we can uh, do a better job each step of the way. And each, each of these, COVID, whatever it is, COVID or whatever, it's a challenge in our journey and we walk hand in hand with our patients together. So thanks for listening and I'll take questions at the end. Um, fantastic. Um, do you wanna, oh, there we go, we stop that chair. Um, Dr. Hayes, that was very interesting. Um, just a quick question. So that chip, two questions actually. That chip, is that something that was invented here in South Florida by your team? Um, that chip, um, actually, um, the chip was invented by a handy, handy, handy husband who was looking for wall studs um, to hang a picture. And he was using that little device of where's the wall stud? It's, it's like something you buy in Home Depot. And he said, oh, if I can do this in a wall, then I can bring this to the lab and we could do this for body parts. Um, and that's how it was designed. We were looking, we had a problem, we were looking for a solution and this was the best solution. So we didn't design it in South Florida, but we were the second site in the United States to use it. We have the most experience in the country and uh, our patients just love it. Um, it can also stay in forever if the patient doesn't need surgery. But if she needs surgery, it's very, very accurate. Mm -hmm. And it's not disfiguring. And I always thought about it, you know, if my dog can have a little chip and I can find my dog, why can't we have a little chip for a woman who has significant needs? So we've been, we've partnered with some of these companies. They've helped us do research. And um, there are several companies, but this one, allows us to follow women with all of our imaging modalities without any trouble. So we well, so that's, a, that's a fascinating story how that came about. And just one final question, thinking ahead with this amazing technology, 
what, uh, what kind of perspectives are we looking at um, in terms of this chip? What more can it do? And could it be also therapeutic there? Could it, could it have some kind that's, of... Yeah, so that's exactly the design. So you build on the shoulders of giants. So once you have a chip, now you can start thinking about delivery of medications. You right. can start delivery of uh, radiation. And each step of the way, we know that there are certain patients that we can do more by doing less. So Joanna mentioned maybe a 70 or an 85 year old woman, she might have a, a, a breast cancer that's going to grow very slowly. And we might be able to deliver some mild medication to her, avoid surgery. So she can die with cancer, but not from cancer. So we just keep building on our experience and, and working through this. But once we can uh, put a little chip in to the spot of interest accurately, then a new world opens up of opportunities. Fascinating. Really, really interesting. So thank you. God should bless you with much continued success in your very important work, helping people, saving lives. And I'm sure during this COVID era, it hasn't gotten any easier. And um, good luck with everything. And I'm sure at the end, we'll have a few questions for you if you're able to hang on a little longer. Sure. Okay. So thank you for that. And now, my friends, we are in, ready to invite our third and final speaker who is eager to share. She's already shared her screen. So Deborah, thank you so much for being here. And she's the Florida Program Director for Sharsheret. And I believe you were with us last year also. In short. I was, yes. And in fact, it was one of my favorite pink Shabbats last year. I was new. It was the first time I had been through October with Shar Sherit, um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And being at Highland Lake Shul was really one of my favorite pink Shabbats. So thank awesome. you. I'll be back again tonight. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hayes. And thank you so much, Joanna. That was really sharing your expertise and sharing your story, Joanna, and the work that you do with the Pink Angels um, really sheds a different, you know, both pieces shed different lights on a breast cancer journey. And it's, you make it, there's a lot of hope involved and a lot of positive. Um, in what, as Rabbi Wolf said, uh, you know, really can be a really dark time. Um, Sharsheret also works with that too. Um, so next year, Sharsheret will celebrate 20 years um, saving lives through education and outreach. Um, Sharsheret is Hebrew for link or chain, and Sharsheret makes connections. We work with women and men and families. Um, who are before, during, and after a cancer diagnosis, providing personalized support. Um, we have a genetic counselor on staff, we have 11 social workers, and we have 12 national programs. And Sharshar really functions with the notion of, of um, Shmirat Haguf, of protecting the body and the soul, and providing support along both avenues. So why a Jewish organization? Um, something we didn't mention tonight is, um, Individuals of Ashkenazi, and they say maybe even Sephardi Jews, um, have genetic predisposition towards cancer-causing um, genes or genetic mutations. Um, and when you have this mutation, it can increase your risk of cancer, breast and ovarian cancer, up to 10 times over the general population. Um, so Sharsherit educates about these risks and provides culturally meaningful support to people with cancer. Um, and our expertise is in Jewish women, um, but up to 20% of the women we help are not Jewish, but have found our support and resources to be meaningful and appropriate as well. Um, I have BRCA, you have BRCA. We all have BRCA. BRCA stands for BR breast, CA cancer. Um, having BRCA, we all have it, but it's when you have a genetic mutation on this BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, that you are at increased risk. Um, and those increased risks affect not just breast and ovarian cancer, but male breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, and melanoma. Um, other gene mutations that put one at risk are um, CHECK2, PALB, ATM, and Lynch syndrome. Those are just a few others. 
Um, and these genetic mutations are dominant ge genetic, they, they're dominant genes. It's not, um, you know, a blue eye gene that's recessive. It's a dominant gene that it takes just one parent to have one and can pass it down to a child. Um, so men and women both carry them. Men and women can both pass them down and men and women can receive them. So you're just as likely to get a genetic mutation from your father as you are from your mother. Um, how does Sharsharet help? So Sharsharet is, um, oops. How do we help? We answer the phones from nine to five across the country. So from the East Coast to the West Coast, the phones are answered in every time zone nine to five. Our website provides numerous opportunities to connect virtually, and we have 12 national culturally relevant programs. But everything we do is confidential, it's highly personalized, and it's free. So, as Joanna made mention of, our hallmark program is our national peer support network. And it's linking women who are newly diagnosed survivors or at high risk with others who have faced similar diagnoses and experiences at the similar time of life and a similar stage of life and keeping in mind their connection to Judaism as well. Um, Sharsher provides tailored support for women with ovarian cancer as well as women with advanced stages of cancer, both ovarian and breast cancer. Um, and we have a very robust genetics for life program being that um, te I think it's about maybe uh, Dr. Hayes can uh, agree. I think it's 10 to 12% of cancer in general or breast and ovarian cancer in general comes from a hereditary um, gene. Um, if you have questions about genetic mutations or genetic testing, you are welcome to call our genetic counselor on staff and have a conversation. Um, in outreach, which is what I do, planning programs like this, um, we have support partner organizations like Highland Lake Shul, like Monica Gerlin, who does it every year. Thank you, thank you. Um, committed to programming throughout the year as well as every October. Um, we have a collection of digital and print resources available on our website. Um, digging deeper into topics like your Jewish genes or thriving again or clinical trials in a new age. Um, we have active campus partnerships um, with Alpha Epsilon Phi Sorority, with Chabad on campus, with Hillel International. Um, uh, a lot of the schools in Florida are active on all three of those pieces and um, it's really wonderful to be working with college kids at, who are um, raising awareness, raising funds, and really bringing the work of Sharsharet to their peers. And we often hear, oh, you know what, I, when they call Sharsharet, oh, I heard about Sharsharet from my daughter's college kid or my friend's college kid or my daughter came home from college and told me about this organization. Um, for several years, Sharsharet has been at the forefront of offering um, four national webinars a year. Since March, we basically have offered them weekly or if not more than once a week in the very beginning, um, including um, updates on COVID and cancer. Um, most recently, we had one on Monday night with a few doctors um, on creating a personal screening plan. And all of the recordings sit on our website as well and are accessible. So um, research shows that addressing a woman's non-medical needs, like Joanna was speaking about, addressing non-medical needs when facing cancer results in better outcomes for individuals. We support the family and the caregivers through our family focus program. Um, one of our favorite programs is the Busy Box program, which is for a mom with young kids who has to go through treatment. Um, it's a box of toys for the kids in the, in the house, a four-year-old boy, a 10-year-old girl, things that they can turn to, pull out when mom needs a rest or when she's going in for treatment, and it includes a book on how to talk to your kids about cancer. Um, our Thriving Again program is um, about defining survivorship. Um, what that means for each individual. Um, as Joe said, you know, 
every day is a gift and you know defining what it means to have come through this um, is something that our thriving again program addresses provides cookbook um, provides a pedometer and exercise bands and tips for you know healthy living again um, and our best face forward program addresses the cosmetic side effects um, and there's all kinds of good things that come in this box um, and a an extension of Best Face Forward is BFF 2.0. And for the first time, Shark Sherrod is providing financial subsidies for things like Joe spoke about, for 3D pigmentation, um, for scalp cooling treatments, which can help preserve the hair follicles during chemotherapy, um, as well as for wigs, because finding the right um, right look and quality for a hair prosthesis is an important part of of coming through the uh, journey. Um, something that Monica asked me to mention was um, this INA, Intelligent Nutrition Assistant. It's something that Sharsharit just started um, promoting. Um, we're responsive to those we help and people in survivorship said um, they are really focused on healthy living and nutrition. So this is an intelligent nutrition assistant and really through your phone, you can get personalized 24 seven nutrition tips at your fingertips. And it's based on um, experienced cancer professionals putting it together and it's safe and secure and it's part of what Char Sherrod offers. Um, so remember Char Sherrod is here for you before, after, during a cancer journey to talk about genetics, to talk about family history. Um, we are where you are at any stage in your cancer journey or in a cancer journey and wherever you are in the US and sometimes in um, Canada and in Israel too. Um, so if you have your phones, you can like us on Facebook. Um, we're very active on social media, like us on Twitter and follow us on Instagram. Um, when you need us, we will answer the call and provide the services that you are looking for. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Wow, yeah. that was very informative in the short amount of time that we had over here tonight. So thank you for sharing that. A lot of information. So Shasherit seems to be doing fantastic work in helping so many people. Um, we have a couple minutes left, a few minutes, and I want to encourage anyone that's joining us here, do you have any questions that you'd like to post, whether it's for any of the speakers in particular, or a question that some of our speakers can address? Would someone like to share a question? Yes, Deborah has a question. Take okay. it away. I have a question for Dr. Hayes. Um, the clips that you're talking about, are those the same type of clip that is like used as a marker for where radiation goes or it's a it's a clip that's going in and actually providing medication or treatment uh, the the clip um that radiation uses is actually made of gold okay. so that's a small chip of gold and it's because uh their equipment needs to be able to find a specific density so they have a little it's called the fiducial it's a fancy name for a chip and they use a little gold based fiducial when we put routine clips in for any biopsy uh, say we think it's benign but we're not sure it's usually an inert chip the price is quite different so a little chip that we put in um, for maybe a fibroadenoma but we just need to mark it that will cost somewhere from 50 to $75. The special chip that we put in that I showed you that has the radar detection, that chip will cost closer to $450. So there's a big price point difference. But if you look at the big picture and Joanna mentioned the co-pays and coming back for all these appointments, um, when we put the chip in that has the radar device, it's one stop shopping, you're one and done. So in other words, you get the biopsy, you get the marker, you don't have to come back for more needle sticks, a localization for surgery. So it's all wrapped up. So you might 
pay a little bit more because it's a multi-purpose device, sort of like your Apple Watch. It does more than just one thing. Hopefully it will do more, these, these devices, whatever, we like a little competition. So we like them to compete and build on each other's successes. So we hope that that's the case. But right now, good question. Radiation uses one type, which is gold. We use another type, usually titanium stainless steel. And the one in the middle, which is more one-stop shop, that is um, something called night and all, um, which is sort of like a little stainless steel. It's what all the, the guide wires and all the cardiac devices, any of the heart devices are made of night and all. So it's very, um, very sturdy and durable. So right now they're made of different, different materials. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Anyone else have a question? Um, Monica, I wanted to actually ask you, Monica, if you wanted to share a couple of words before we close up. And then Monica has a question. So let's unmute you. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yeah, you're muted, Monica. Yeah, does that work? There you go. Yep. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank everyone who who joined us. Really, um, I'm really happy that every everybody's here, and, uh, and thank you so much to our speakers. I know we could put faces to um, the names, and uh, I will just put a little plug in that I, I've used Memorial Healthcare System. I, my children were born there, <laughs> and I've used them, and they're fantastic. Um, really the, the center on, I go to the Memorial South on Washington Street and the whole group, it, the women there are incredible and they really make you feel just coming in for a mammogram, you know, comfortable and, and very pleasant and uh, it's pretty quick too. So don't put it off if you need to do it. Um, that's a great place to go. <laughs> the question I had, I guess maybe for the doctor, although or maybe Joanna, um, all of you, is uh, again, the nutrition, which was what interested me on that app, but how important, it seems like today, especially today, since more people are home and, and really focusing on what they're eating or, or eating the wrong things, but how important, what role does the food really in our, in our universe play on, besides the BRCA and so forth, on getting um, breast cancer or be, you know, is a play a role? I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll Thank chime you. in. I, there's, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about food and breast cancer. They, you know, they look at uh, dairy often as something that's talked about, um, meat, obviously, alcohol. I, I wrote a blog when I was going through treatment and I, I talked a lot about, there's a lot of shaming that goes on around um, cancer in general and that people as a defense mechanism, they tend to want to protect themselves. So if they don't eat dairy, then they won't get breast cancer. So they'll say, oh, she, I saw her eating ice cream the other day. Of course she got, you know, so there's, there's too much, in my opinion, of course, that goes into it. Of course, eat healthy. Eat the healthiest you can for a million different reasons. Heart, cancer, diabetes, there's a million. You'll feel better when you eat better. But I don't believe there's these magic things that you can do. And it's, it, I think so much of it is genetic. So much of it's environmental. And of course, food is a component, but my, my long answer is that uh, eat what makes sense to you because next week they'll tell you asparagus is terrible and don't eat it. And then a month later, it's the best thing, eat only asparagus. So I just believe in doing the best you can and what makes you feel good and that's the right thing. Thank you, Joanna. Anyone else wanna add something, doctor, to that? Thank you. Uh, I agree with Joanna. Um, if people want to think about nutrition, one of the things they can um, look at is uh, some of the blue zones around the world where they have a high rate of people living over 100 years. You can look at their diets and see what pieces of that you might want to um, challenge yourself and try to try to 
incorporate that part into your life. Um, everybody has to balance what's sustainable for them. Um, generally, colorful foods are good foods for you. And uh, in the blue zones, uh, people that use um, beans as their protein uh, tend to live longer in general. But again, everyone's individual and you have to do what fits your lifestyle best. So once in a while, a bag of colorful candy is okay? <laughs> M&M's. M&M's. <laughs> well, um, that's very interesting. Any other questions before we're going to close it up for this evening? Now that we have the opportunity with such a special guest with us this evening. I have one other, actually. I don't want to take away time from anyone else. Does anyone else have a question? Um, no, Monica, go ahead and then, uh, you know, okay. I just want to conclude. Uh, I guess for the doctor, um, and it's happened to me in the past, and I don't, let's say you have a mammogram and, um, and then they say, oh, you need a, um, an ultrasound. Um, it doesn't happen every time, but is it a better idea that if you've had that in the past that you ask the doctor to say, I want to write a script for a mammogram as well as an ultrasound, even though you've had regular mammos? Oh, um, thanks. Uh, so some people, uh, again, Joanna mentioned the co-pays and the insurance issues. So if you're coming in for a screening mammogram, it's nice to have a screening mammogram prescription. And then in case you need the ultrasound, separate prescription for the ultrasound. Some people like to come in uh, during promotional time. So maybe a mammogram is only, I don't know, $50 or $90. Whatever the promo is, it's usually in October and May. So some people like to pay cash for that, get that study done, and then use their insurance for their ultrasound. So we try to provide people lots of options. Uh, not everybody has great insurance or some people have really high, high co-pays. So, and some people can only get it paid for if it's screening, not a diagnostic. It's, a, it's chaos with these insurance companies. So if you're somebody who has quote unquote dense tissue and you're a doctor and you know you might be sent back for an ultrasound, I just tell the patients to have two separate prescriptions so they have it handy. And if they want to add it on that same day, they already have their prescription. And then if they don't need it, they don't need it and it's not wasteful. Uh, if you talked about some of the people that have uh, genetic uh, abnormalities like the BRCA genes, the high-risk women, those patients typically, everyone always gets a questionnaire when they come in. And if the women have a greater than 20 or 25% a lifetime likelihood they'll get it recommended for an MRI. Ideally, we try to schedule the MRI six months off cycle to the mammogram. Um, but if any one study is the most sensitive and the most relevant, it's the MRI. Mm -hmm. So for women that have, uh, because of COVID, missed some studies, they have to figure out how to, when to jump back in. So if they've missed things, they try to, need, they need to catch up. So they might need to get their mammogram and MRI together. And the ultrasound is always supplementary um, to be used in your back pocket if you need it. But the MRI is better than the ultrasound. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, and, and if I can piggyback on what Dr. Hayes said, we are doing the $50 uh, mammos at Memorial till November 15th, which is extended this year because of COVID. Please tell anyone that is putting it off because their copay is high or they don't have insurance. It's $50 for the mammo and I believe 99 uh, with an ultrasound. So uh, spread the word and it's till November 15th this year, which is great. Amazing. Okay, well, um, thank you for that very helpful information. And everyone who needs to take opportunity should, should take, up, take up that opportunity. I wanna just share finally, um, First of all, thanking, thanking Monica once again. This has been a very special evening. Thanking Dr. Hayes. We know you're very busy. Uh, everyone's very busy, but thank you for joining us. And Joanna, so special to hear your story and to get to meet you. Hopefully we'll get to meet you in person very soon. And thank you, Deborah, um, for sharing uh, all of your special work and on behalf of Shasheret here in Florida. And, you know, I, 
we we believe in um, in, in in treating a, bo a body holistically. So of course we have to deal with certain uh, uh, illnesses and diseases, but more importantly, and this has come up tonight as well, to see what else is going on in the body, in the person's life, in their mind, in their heart, in their spirit. And um, I really appreciated what you shared, Deborah, about Shasheret, which is serving a need, particularly in the Jewish community, because a very powerful strength in the Jewish community is just that, is community. And um, I mean, that exists in other places as well, but in Judaism, we have a very strong emphasis and a wonderful um, display of that. And the, the support, of community like you have that peer-to-peer -peer program well you know back in bc before COVID times we had these programs every day or every week where you could come to a synagogue and really find friends connect with friends talk with each other share lives and so i want to end off with uh this kind of recommendation to myself and to everybody and maybe the doctor or someone else has something to, in to some input over here is and, and for those of us that thank God are healthy and haven't caught such diseases and, and please God will never catch such diseases and those who have caught it will have recovered and will stay recovering, recovering forever is to think about how to create uh, sustained health of body, very important, like the foods and the exercise that we've spoken about tonight, but also health of mind and health of spirit and health of spiritual life. And all these things work together in a fascinating way. And the more we strengthen all of these pieces in our lives, our social lives, our spiritual lives, um, our mental strength, the things that we're reading, things we're thinking about, how we're thinking. We're in a period of time right now that if you just put on your social media or the news, there is so much toxic garbage going on out there. And it's so easy to get drawn into it. And all of a sudden it's 2.30 in the morning and you're like, what did I just do? How did I pollute my mind with such... Um, silliness and, and staying staying up to date with the news is important but you've got to know who you can what you should be reading and what's important and what's not and so um we should focus on that our physical health is really important um like we've seen in COVID, some people have lost tremendous amounts of weight some people have gained tremendous amounts of weight so everybody's dealing with that differently but um let's a blessing a blessing to us all a prayer to god that with our efforts because God is our partner. So we're in it as well with our efforts of living healthy lives. And the main thing is to be able to deal with preventative medicine. So we want to be able to prevent anything coming our way. And now in this period of time, additional measures of protecting ourselves from the virus and other such things going around. And uh, God should bless us to be healthy and eat lots of beans. Now I learned that tonight because I want to live till 172. So I'm going to be telling my wife about that, beans. And um, thank you again to everybody for joining us. And maybe you want to unmute yourself and thank our speakers and Monica yourselves. Feel free to go ahead and do that. And uh, this will be available on YouTube tomorrow if you want to get back to it or, or share it with somebody. And I'm so happy that we could do this. And I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Good luck, thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I really, I really Again, appreciate Mom. it. Thank you. I really <laughs> it. Hopefully next year, God willing, we'll be in person. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye, Thank you.